Hey folks, Andy Patton here, joined today by Tristan Freeman, the site editor for Fansided's college basketball site, Busting Brackets. Tristan and I are going to discuss Gonzaga's title odds, as well as a look at the WCC and how the bubble is shaping up, all right here on the Locked On Zags podcast. Don't go away. You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome to the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to take you through another season of Gonzaga Hoops as we get into March I'm thrilled today to be joined by Tristan Freeman. Tristan manages the college basketball site Busting Brackets, is an expert on all things college hoops, edited a handful of articles I wrote about a year or so ago when I was writing at Busting Brackets. Super thrilled to have you on the show, Tristan. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me on, Andy. Appreciate being able to talk to you about basketball again. Absolutely, man. I'm excited about this. I know you've... uh, You've been on the New Bloods spaces, done the podcast with them and everything, and I know you've always had a, had a close relationship with Gonzaga, even though you are not a Gonzaga alumni, and I just wanted to kind of ask you a little bit about what it is you think about the Gonzaga fan base, what has kind of kept you interested in kind of engaging with this group of people uh, as we've seen this program kind of take off at, at levels that are really unprecedented in the last couple of years. Yeah, I've been a, a fan of Gonzaga, even though I'm from the Pittsburgh area and uh, been a Panthers fan my whole life. I've, I've always had a, a, a spot in my heart for Gonzaga, especially during the Kevin Pangos and Gary Bell mm-hmm. era. And then ever since then, the program just continued to ascend. And when you're a, consistently a top 10 team every year, it's kind of hard to leave that bandwagon once you mm-hmm. have a legitimate affinity for it. And yeah. I've always been able to to talk with the Gonzaga fan base or some of the most knowledgeable fans out there, not only just for the, uh, the team in WCC, but considering that they're an annual contender in a tournament, they also have a knowledge of college basketball at large to see who are the teams that they're likely going to face in March. And it's always great to have discourse with college basketball, especially with Gonzaga and the WCC. Absolutely. Yeah, I love that you mentioned the, the Kevin Pangos, Gary Bell era. You know, that I graduated from Gonzaga in 2013, so that was their sophomore year. That was the the big Kelly Olynyk season. And uh, I, I spoke with Ken Pomeroy last week, and one of the things that he talked about was kind of the the difference between that Gonzaga and this Gonzaga. And I think that a lot of more casual college basketball fans maybe have a harder time separating those two things of like, you know, they'll say like, oh, Gonzaga's got a horrible record against top seeds in the NCAA tournament. It's like, yeah, for the first 15 years of this program making the tournament, they were 11 seeds or nine seeds. Like They were not at the level that they've been at recently. And I, I appreciate people who can kind of see the difference between those two things, because even in that Kevin Pangos era, like you talked about, like my, my four years in college, I think they were a nine seed, a 11 seed, a seven seed, and then a, then a one seed, obviously the year they lost to Wichita State. So uh, obviously as somebody who's seen the program for a while, like what have you thought about this kind of monumental shift that this program has gone under just in the last half decade? Yeah, I think we look at the new era with the transfer portal and, and, mm-hmm. and people who are Gonzaga fans know that Mark Few has, has always been a transfer advocate, even back mm-hmm. towards the, you look at the uh, Kyle Wiltshire yep. pickup for Kentucky then you have uh, Byron Wesley from USC, mm-hmm. Jordan Matthews. Mm-hmm. Gonzaga always had, you know, the underrated, you know, three-star mm-hmm. level talent and sort of the gold mine international players. But yeah. the transfer portal quietly gave them that power conference athleticism that mm-hmm. can compete in the non-conference and in the NCAA tournament. In the past few years, now they're getting consistently top 50, even five-star caliber talent. Yeah which is why they're consistently a top 10 team. It's mm-hmm. it's not, a, you know, you could argue that Kevin Pangos and Gary Bell Jr. may not even be Gonzaga recruits yeah. in 2021, yeah. 22. And, yeah. and they're considered, you know, the recent legends of the team. That mm-hmm. That's how much their recruitment has advanced for this team. And now, you know, people you know, always joke, oh, Gonzaga can't win the SEC, the Big 12, and all of them. Mm-hmm. Zaga absolutely could win those conferences. Yeah. There, there's, there's no question. This talent is not mm-hmm. WCC talent. This is nationally good talent, and it's a credit to the coaching staff that slowly developed the talent pool 
mm -hmm. to put them at this point where they're now annual national contenders. Absolutely. And I think it, there's a really nice point about the transfer portal. I think, you know, we, we talk about the Kelly Olynyk era and, and his development when he took a year off uh, to redshirt and came back and was, you know, all American top 15 pick in the NBA draft. And you kind of pair that success they had developing a player behind the scenes with the increase in transfers. And it was just like they hit it at the perfect time because then they hit Wiltshire. And then you got like a Jonathan Williams who comes in, had a successful career before he got to Gonzaga, sat out a year and then was an absolute monster. Brandon Clark, you know, an incredible player at San Jose State. But I don't know that anybody thought he would ascend to that level of greatness that he was for the Zags in 2018, 2019. And I think, you know, it's it's such a it, again, the timing was perfect to bring everything together to get this transfer portal. And then you start seeing, like you said, Kevin Pangos may not get recruited here. And that's crazy to me. And I think it's hard for me as somebody who follows the team very closely and certainly for people who are a little bit less engaged on a daily basis to to understand that, like Nolan Hickman, for example, like his skill level and what kind of recruit he was out of high school, like he was loads better out, out of high school than most of the point guards Gonzaga has ever had in their school history. That doesn't mean that he's better than those guys necessarily, but it's it's wild to see that and see him being a guy who's like a fringe contributor to the roster this year. It's just an unreal development for this program. Yeah, and, and you remember the Josh Perkins era where he came yeah. in as a true freshman starter. That was mm -hmm. sort of where, you know, yeah, Nigel Williams Goss having to sit out a year. Right. You know, that that will never happen again. Mark Fee will never mm -hmm. allow a situation where he only has one true ball handler on the roster. Yeah. Now now with guys not having to sit out, you, you can have, you know, mm -hmm. multiple guys come in anytime. And mm -hmm. you can have a veteran. You know, you saw Geno Crandall and Aaron Cook the past couple yeah. of years play that veteran backup role. Mm -hmm. That that's another key to why Gonzaga continues to win games. Mm -hmm. And not have these, you know, sort of these weird losses because there's always some kind of st st uh, stability yep. on the court, the ball handler position. Absolutely. So, Tristan, you've obviously seen a lot of this team this season um, and obviously a lot of them last season. I'm curious your impressions. Uh, it's been a, an often topic of discussion about, like, which year's team is better between this year's team and last year's team. And last year's team, obviously, it's very difficult to replace a player like Jalen Suggs, a player like Corey Kisper, a player like Joel Yai, three extraordinarily talented guys. But last year's team didn't have a Chet, and this year's team's got a Chet Holmgren, and that's a completely different dynamic uh, from last year's roster that, that lacked rim protection, that lacked depth in the front court. Now you have that in droves because of Chet Holmgren, because of the emergence of, of Anton Watson. I'm curious having watched both these teams, what your kind of thoughts are between the two of them and, you know, this team's potential path uh, to another another run to the NCAA tournament championship. Yeah, I think last year's team was probably the most explosive team mm -hmm. of, of just in all college basketball the past 20 years. Their ability to throw out knockout punches with Kispert's mm -hmm. shooting ability, Jalen Suggs' just athleticism to just get whatever he wants, and then mm -hmm. Timmy obviously down low. Mm -hmm. That Last year's Gonzaga team could just, you know, demoralize anybody yeah. not named Baylor. That, mm -hmm. But this year's team, you know, even though they have a whole bunch of blowouts, they've, they've mm -hmm. won all their WCC games outside of that game of Moraga by double digits. Mm -hmm. it, it hasn't been in that, the, the same level of, you know, pure dominance. It's sort of yeah. been a slow ascension towards a 20, 30 point win. You even saw right. it in, in this year's WCC tournament mm -hmm. against uh, San Fran and St. Mary's on the third time around. Yeah. They have to really fight for those wins. And, yeah. and part of it is, you know, when you have Nemhard and, and, and Bolt and Lee in the offense, they're not just, just going to go out and drop 25 or 30 on you. Right. But but this team, and you talked about it with Chet Holmgren's defense, this team may be more equipped to win mm -hmm. in March. You know, I, it's, it's hard to say more last year because the only team last year that could have beaten Gonzaga is the one they saw in the finals. Basically. Right. So, so it's hard to, to compare the tournament fields because mm -hmm. I think this year's field isn't necessarily even that much stronger because even the teams at the top still have their fair share of weaknesses. Right. Potentially even, even this Gonzaga team could have a flaw or two mm -hmm. that could hurt them. But I think they're, they're equipped to take on just about any team in the country. There's no one that you could say, Oh, they'll definitely be afraid of not Auburn or Arizona or any of them. Mm -hmm. That's kind of, that's, that's where I'm at too with this is like, 
this team may not be as singularly dominant as last year's team, but there is not a, you know, a Baylor for lack of a better term. Like there's not another team that's like the one B to them necessarily. And it doesn't mean that there aren't teams that can beat them. There are actually more teams that are capable of beating them, but nobody who is like definitively like, Hey, that's a team that would probably beat Gonzaga. Every team, I think Gonzaga has proven they're capable of beating every team in the country and nobody necessarily is like, oh, that team really, really scares me. And I want to get into that a little bit more in the second segment with you, Tristan, because there are a few teams out there that that are pretty darn good. And I'm curious if we end up seeing some of those matchups, what, what you think those might look like. But before we get to that, I want to tell you all about Built Bar. This is the time of year that I've pretty much given up on all of my New Year's resolutions, but not this year. I'm sticking to my resolution to eat right thanks to Built Bar. It almost feels like it's not really a resolution because I actually enjoy eating them. Have you tried the puffs? If you haven't, you're missing out on one of Built Bar's best tasting bars. Puffs are not, are the first ever protein infused marshmallow. They're fluffy, they're marshmallowy. They're not just a protein bar, they're a treat. And they're covered in 100% real chocolate. In fact, all Built Bars are covered in 100% real chocolate. A typical candy bar can be anywhere from two to 300 calories. Most Built Bars contain 130 calories, four grams of sugar, four net carbs, and just 17 grams of protein. They have mint brownie, coconut, coconut almond, and new for this month, white chocolate cookies and cream. They are all delicious, and new flavors are coming out all of the time. Go to Built.com, use promo code LOCKED15, and you'll get 15% off your order. That's promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. All right, segment two, Still Andy Patton, still joined today by Tristan Freeman. I want to thank all of you out there for making Locked On Zags your first listen of the day. Make sure to check out the Locked On Bracket Breakdown on March 14th right here on Locked On Zags podcast feed and YouTube channel. College basketball expert Chris Gordy, myself, and betting expert Lee Sterling are there to give you in-depth breakdowns on every matchup of the NCAA tournament. Tristan, I want to talk about the this Gonzaga team's weaknesses a little bit. We kind of touched on that in the first segment, touched on some of those teams that that are definitely maybe not as good as that Baylor team last year, but certainly teams that are capable of winning the NCAA tournament. When Selection Sunday rolls around, what are the teams on that two line or that three line that you think Gonzaga fans might might be a little nervous if they end up seeing them pop up? Yeah, I think – you know, you look at the non-conference with, with the Duke and Alabama losses. I think one thing they both had in common was a, a, a athletic and, and powerful big man that mm-hmm. could at least bother Drew Timmy. You yeah. know, uh, Betty Ocko, as raw as he was, really had an effective game with a bunch of blocks against Timmy. Yep. Same with Mark Williams, who was the ACC Defensive Player of the Year. Mm-hmm. I think you're, you're never going to stop Timmy and, and make him go like two, two points on one of ten shooting. You know, that mm-hmm. Moraga game was just that, as – uh, uh, almost impossible as you can imagine for him, but but if you can make sure that you know you don't have to double Timmy and make mm-hmm. the guards beat you, then that's going to be the recipe to, to keeping Gonzaga's offensive base. So I think you look at teams, you know, you know Baylor just lost uh, everyday John for the season, but mm-hmm. you know Scott Drew's always going to uh, you know have some kind of game plan to, to stop Gonzaga, and he's familiar with them as well. You don't mm-hmm. really want to see Baylor with their guards, assuming they're healthy. Yeah. You know, uh, you look at, you know, obviously Auburn, you don't want to see with Walker Kessler. He's going to be someone that can guard him one-on-one. Arizona with Christian Coloco and even mm-hmm. Umar Ballo off the bench, who has been yeah. one of the most improved players in the Pac-12 after transferring. Mm-hmm. But, but I, I think the good news is there's just not a lot of great guard play mm-hmm. in the country, so to – you know, your Gonzaga is most likely going to have an advantage with uh, with uh, Nemhard and Bolton and Strother mm-hmm. in the backcourt. You just have to hope that you don't see a team, and you can you can argue Illinois as well with Kofi Coburn, mm-hmm. uh, an All American player, what he can do. I, I think Illinois will be a tough matchup as well. But there really isn't a team that that Gonzaga fans should be worried about. But mm-hmm. I think a lot of them, even including the you know four seeds and couple eight or nines that mm-hmm. could potentially cause issues if they have the center but if you don't have a legit center like we saw last year against Creighton in the sweet 16 mm-hmm. you're you're it's going to be it's going to be a handful and you're not going to have the advantage that Randy Bennett had mm-hmm. going up against him you know multiple times a year with Matthias Toss I think Toss right. is a solid player mm-hmm. but it was as much as he just shuts down Timmy as much as the, the game plan St. Mary's had they knew how to, to, to they knew how to do it 
that's yeah. not something that the teams in the NCAA tournament is going to be able to do. Well, and that's, I think you, you'd absolutely nailed it with a lot of that. And I think what's interesting to me is like, because Gonzaga has enough depth in the front court that you really need, I mean, you don't need two elite shot blockers to beat Gonzaga, but you need more than just one good front court player. And like, I know that you Misalski is not necessarily on the level of a lot of the bigs that Gonzaga would see in the NCAA tournament, but he's, he's, plays at San Francisco, really, really good big man. But part of the reason Gonzaga was able to kind of handle San Francisco all three times they played them was because they didn't have anybody else. So like Masalski can match up with Chet or match up with Drew, but nobody's nobody's guarding the other guy. And so for me, like looking at, you know, you look at Arizona, like they're probably not going to play Balo and Coloco together all that often. Are they going to put Tabellis on Chet? Is that going to work? He's a 6'10 guard, you know, like there's just a lot of kind of challenges with guarding Gonzaga. And obviously, you know, Gonzaga defensively, while they're very good, there are going to be some players out there that challenge them as well. Uh, I'm curious if there are some teams out there, you know, again, we'll talk about Selection Sunday, talking about when the bracket comes out. Um, there's a few teams that might make Gonzaga fans a little bit weary, but are there teams that maybe you think they might match up fairly well against that could be could end up on their side of the bracket? Yeah, it'll be. I don't think they'll end up on their bracket, but I think a team like Villanova, it mm -hmm. is one that it could be matchup based where Gonzaga has a field day. You know, Eric Dixon at the five, Jermaine Samuels, who reportedly has gotten hurt in a mm -hmm. game against St. John's today, mm -hmm. they don't have many front court depth. And as good of players as Colin Col Gillespie and Justin Moore is, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's likely going to be a stalemate against Gonzaga's guard. So where is a team like Villanova going to get their offensive mm -hmm. firepower uh, mm -hmm. against Gonzaga? And a team like Kansas – you know, you saw Drew Timmy, you know, absolutely dominated David McCormick in the first game of last year. He, mm -hmm. He's been off and on. And you've seen Bill Self try to look at different lineups that mm -hmm. could work. And I, I, you would have to play McCormick against Timmy uh, mm -hmm. 15, 20 plus minutes. But I don't know if that's necessarily good for them to win. So there's, I think, quite a few. T I think any team that really doesn't have a dynamic center mm -hmm. that will force you to double. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's going it's going to be a long night for for any of them uh, there's one one matchup in particular i'm really curious about um and i didn't prep you for this one so so sorry in advance about that but um curious about a potential matchup with purdue because purdue obviously uh, obviously has two very talented front court players zach Eady and trevion williams but they don't play them together very often uh and obviously you know the the depth beyond that on this roster excluding Jaden Ivey of course is is a little bit spotty I'm curious for a team that is one of the few teams that can offensively hang with Gonzaga they're not a great defensive team I've thought long and hard about how I think this matchup would go but I'm curious if you have any kind of instinctive thoughts about what what that game might look like if it were to happen yeah, so if you look solely on when Purdue's on defense against Gonzaga, there's 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 one good and one uh, bad thing about the match. I think mean, the good part is that Andrew Nemhard is one of the best players in the country at the pick and roll screens, and that's Edie's weakness. Yeah. And so you give someone like Nemhard time to to work on him, he could easily play him off the court. Yeah. Uh, I, I think the one negative though is that, and this is for not just Edie but all the bigs in the Big Ten. Part of the issues mm -hmm. they had last year was. When they go up against bigs that can space the floor, they don't know how to defend that because right. none of the bigs in the Big Ten can do that. The mm -hmm. issue, of course, is that Drew Timmy can't do that. You know, he right. takes his one three a game, and it's usually yeah. a break. Yeah. So, so that it could actually be a scenario where, and I don't think you would ever see Mark Few do this, where mm -hmm. Holmgren or Watson would be better at the five yeah. against Edie and Purdue. Mm -hmm. and sort of limit Timmy's minutes if you really want to exploit him when he's on court. Travion yeah. Williams, on the other hand, though, he's probably a better matchup for Gonzaga because he, A, can get Timmy in foul trouble because he's just a big, wide body. Yeah. And his passing ability, I think, would take pressure off of Jaden Ivey because do you really want Ivey playing that point guard role against a team like Gonzaga who's so mm -hmm. good defensively that they'll make any mistake pay? So you might yeah. want to maximize the passing – you could argue that William, that Travion Williams would be a better player to go against Gonzaga and Edie, and that Holmgren and Watson could be better than Timmy. But of course, there's no way that you're going to sit all Americans on a bench in a potential Final Four game. You're right. just going to have to, you know, play out the matchups and hope that one wins over the other. Absolutely. Well, so I'm going to full disclosure here for those listening. We're recording this at about 5 p.m. Pacific time on Thursday. So not all of the games of today are done. But Tristan, I want to talk about what has been going on with the bubble 
Uh, obviously, the WCC, which we'll talk about a lot more in the third segment, uh, kind of has some teams floating around that area. It looks like, you know, St. Mary's is obviously safe. San Francisco looks probably like they're pretty safe. Um, BYU, a little bit less, uh, looking pretty unlikely that they're going to make it. But we've already seen a handful of these these conference tournaments games that have cost some teams some potential bubble spots. Xavier lost, Wake Forest lost, Florida lost, Michigan lost. Uh, I'm curious just kind of your thoughts on, A, what this really means for BYU, a potential for a four-bid WCC, which has long been the dream of myself and many people listening to the show, but uh, has looked a little bit less likely in recent weeks. And also just kind of how much more shifting you see uh, going down on this bubble. Yeah, I think if there was any doubt about San Francisco is that these past two days locked up their bid. I yeah. thought they were I thought they were going to be in decent shape even had they lost to BYU because their metrics were so good. But mm-hmm. seeing all these projected 10 and 11 seeds lose yeah. and are done for the week, I, I think they're, they're in a safe spot. I wouldn't be surprised if something happens and they end up as a nine seed. They, they, mm-hmm. they, I think they've really benefited from this week. Yeah. For BYU, I, I think the problem that they're going to have is has anyone lost – bad enough to where BYU can go ahead of them. Right. I think I think their their issue is that, and, and I'm probably mistaken on math, is they haven't had anything better than a quad four win in over a month. Mm-hmm. All they all they beaten is LMU and Pepperdine. Yeah. They they mm-hmm. lost to San Fran, they lost to St. St. Mary's. Every mm-hmm. opportunity they had to help their resume, they they lost. Mm-hmm. And their metrics were solid you know, really good in January, but then you get blown out by Gonzaga mm-hmm. twice. You get you you pretty much get blown out by the other teams, and then you 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 could you barely beat the, the quad four games, which hurt right. the metrics more. Mm-hmm. I just don't see outside of a decent quad one and two record what they what they can argue for that'll get them in the tournament. And, yeah. and I think you know Wake Forest and Xavier lost, but I think they were pretty healthy ahead of BYU mm-hmm. even beforehand. You know, yeah. Indiana was a team that probably could have slipped below BYU, but they win. Mm-hmm. You look at SMU, who's going to be playing in the tournament, uh, uh, AAC tournament. If they beat Memphis in the semifinals, they'll move up. And mm-hmm. then I, I believe Virginia Tech's winning right now yeah. against Notre Dame. If they win that game, they'll mm-hmm. move up. So, yeah. you know, I think the 10 seeds losing helps BYU because it adds more teams to the conversation. Mm-hmm. But we're looking a few teams that could easily just bump them in the next yeah. couple of days and just pretty much put them back to square one. Well, not only that, I mean, obviously you're going to get some bid stealers too. You're going to get some some teams that win some conference games or win some conference championships that that could potentially cause some some issues. You know, depending on who wins the Mountain West, depending on who wins the Pac-12. You know, maybe maybe it's it's goes chalk and you get a you know Colorado State win and an Arizona win, but maybe. You know, maybe somebody shocks us. Maybe Utah State wins the Mountain West and then they steal a bid there. Maybe, uh, you know, Oregon somehow <laughs> uh, pulls out a victory and, and makes it into the, the field of 68 that way. Uh, I'm curious, uh, before we move on to the third segment, talk a little bit more about the WCC. Um, we're seeing a lot. We kind of touched on a few of them, Florida, Michigan being kind of the primary examples of these pretty mid-level power five schools that are seemingly trying hard to to make themselves not have a great case for making the NCAA tournament. Uh, years past tell us that these teams are probably still going to make it. Uh, there's going to be a lot of teams that are one, two, maybe three games over 500 that, that still make it into the field over some arguably better uh, mid-major programs. We can ignore BYU because, as you mentioned, their metrics are a little bit spotty. Uh, but I'm curious – your just general thoughts. I don't think that there's ever going to be a real shift here because of uh, money for the most part. But if you think that there's a case regularly for some of these, like, you know, the, the second best team in the WAC or the second best team in, in some of the other good basketball conferences where they're not ever really getting two bids. If you think there's, there's a solid argument that, Hey, we don't need to put a 500 Michigan team into this field. We can put somebody else here. Who's maybe uh, not, you know, who, who might have a, a legitimate argument being at least as good or potentially better. Yeah, I, the problem with that's always going to be that, you know, Michigan can struggle for three weeks and then beat yep. Ohio State on the road yep. and then follow yep. that up with winning against Iowa. And then mm-hmm. realistically, is there a mid-major that can do the same thing? You right. know, St. Mary's was the closest team to that because they mm-hmm. beat San Francisco and BYU at the same week. Right. But even, I think that's rare for mid-majors to do outside yeah. of Gonzaga, of course. So mm-hmm. it's always going to be hard for mid-majors to fight for respect because 
there, there's such there's such a small margin of error. You know, even yeah. Dayton, who after the disastrous opening part of the season with three quad four losses, fought their way all the way back to go on the bubble and mm-hmm. then loses to LaSalle. You yeah. know, and it's hard to say, and it's hard to be like, well, let's put Dayton in over Michigan, even though they just lost to LaSalle, whereas mm-hmm. Michigan loses to Iowa or right. Purdue in that week. So yeah. It's always going to be a balance, but I think overall the mid majors have done well. You know, the WCC's mm-hmm. good getting three to four, Mountain West three to four, mm-hmm. eight ten, uh, around likely two to three, assuming Davidson doesn't win the tournament. I thought for overall the mid majors did fairly well, considering mm-hmm. that you know the Pac twelve and ACC's ACC's down. But mm-hmm. as far as respect overall for the WCC. There always will be some for Gonzaga. They've earned it. St. Mary's has slowly earned it. Mm-hmm. BYU is a national brand. They'll always be in the mix. But for the others, it's going to come down to consistently win it. You know, San Francisco had a great year, but can they build off of it, which is going to be hard because they're likely going to lose their three best players. Yeah, absolutely. And that, Tristan, that's exactly what I want to get into a little bit more on the third segment is San Francisco, Santa Clara, some of those other programs that – uh, have have built themselves some momentum, but are they going to be able to carry that a little bit forward? Uh, before we talk about that, though, let's talk about Bet Online. There might be less football being played, but BetOnline.net has way more stuff to bet on this playoff season. From scores, totals, and player performance props to where the next fired coach is going to land, Bet Online is the number one spot for all things NFL betting in 2022. And it's not just football. BetOnline.net's basketball, hockey, boxing, and UFC odds coverage is the best in the business. From sports right down to your favorite Vegas casino games, BetOnline is your number one online wagering destination. BetOnline is the fastest and easiest way to wager on all of your favorite sports and play your favorite games. All right, segment three, still Andy Patton, still locked on Zag, still chatting here with Tristan Freeman of Busting Brackets. Tristan, you started to touch on it, which was a perfect segue into the third segment here, talking about those non BYU, Gonzaga, St. Mary's teams in the WCC. Obviously, BYU is not going to be around much longer. And like you said, St. Mary's has eventually started to finally claim some some uh, some of that respect nationally. But uh, we see it every year. It happens around the time that the college football season officially ends. And people start to get a little rankled at how how well Gonzaga is rated because they are they play in the WCC and they play a bunch of high school teams. And, and certainly that narrative has become a little bit less prominent. You don't see as many people who actually like really cover the game who say that it's more of just kind of casuals and people who like to stir stuff up on Twitter who say that, but it's still there and it's not completely gone. I don't know what it's going to take for it to change. Uh, I don't know that it is going to change necessarily, but for people who maybe haven't paid that much attention, like I'm curious your thoughts just on the WCC in general and some of the improvements from, from those non big three teams that we saw this year. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I'd be remiss to not point out the fact that the WCC, pro- more than probably any other conference, benefited from the extra year of eligibility from, yeah. from the COVID. You yeah. look up pretty much all the teams, with mm-hmm. the exception of Gonzaga mm-hmm. and St. Mary's, got their star players back for it. BYU yeah. got Alex Barcelo and Milwaukee transfer T. John Lucas for that fifth year. Santa Clara have rankage. Uh, mm-hmm. San Francisco have Bouye and Shabazz coming back. Yeah. Even LMU, despite their disappointing season, it would have been a lot worse had Eli Scott not been able to come right. back. So yeah. it's good on the conference that they took advantage of it and got mm-hmm. multiple bids because of it. But next year is going to go back to really a normal year roster-wise, especially yeah. after losing all of these seniors. Mm-hmm. And, and you have to wonder, what are these coaches going to do when it comes yeah. to looking for the next level of talent? You know, losing rank, uh, rankage is going to be a problem because they don't have the same bigs to come in. The, right. They have Jalen Williams, who is who is an NBA right. uh, talent. Hopefully he, he stays at Santa Clara, but he could be a transfer candidate mm-hmm. depending on if, if, if other teams are interested. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I think Ty Golden is probably closer to being a new Pac-12 coach. Yeah. Then, then he is taking a step back because I, I think he's definitely yeah. earned a lot of praise with mm-hmm. how, how with his analytical approach. Mm-hmm. But they're going to have to rebuild too their entire backcourt. But mm-hmm. assuming he has another good year with a new cast of guys, yeah, they, they should be okay. But I, th- I think the WCC, including BYU in their mm-hmm. last year, there's going to be a lot of teams that's going to take a step back, mm-hmm. and it, it's it's going to be really interesting to see. 
who are the newcomers. There's going to be a lot of freshmen and sophomores going to get plenty of playing time. There's a lot of transfers that could come in and get leading roles. But, you know, it, this is going to be a really important postseason for the WCC with three, with likely three teams to, mm -hmm. to take advantage and make a run, similar to what the Pac-12 did, because nobody thought the Pac-12 was going to get all those teams to the Elite Eight. Yeah. You know, since, you know, St. Mary's and, and San Francisco have such unique styles and such unique players, they can absolutely catch a couple of teams off guard and make runs. Yeah. 100%. I think, you know, St. Mary's, is they got to win the first one. But if they can do that and they got to turn around two days later and the team, you know, whatever team – they're going to face is going to have to figure out how to beat St. Mary's in two days. Like that's really hard to do. And for, for San Francisco, like whoever they play, even in the first round, probably isn't going to be all that familiar with them and what they're doing. And I think that that, that could give those two teams a pretty big advantage, but you, you brought up a great point about the transfer portal and, and the impact that it has had on the conference. Obviously so many of the talented players that we saw this year were, you know, transfer guys, PJ pipes at Santa Clara, even, even at the smaller schools, Marcellus Erlington uh, at San Diego was awesome. Uh, everybody who was good on Portland's team was a transfer. Uh, you know, Shantae brought Tyler Robertson, you have Moses Wood over from UNLV, like a lot of really talented players there. And, and I'm curious how much of that momentum they can they can sustain. And, and I think the biggest thing for me, it's always this has always been the biggest thing is good coaches have to stay in the WCC. And right now there's not enough incentive for them to do so. This is why San, San Francisco making the tournament in my mind is such a huge thing for the WCC because before, no matter how good you were at San Francisco or Santa Clara or Pepperdine or wherever, you were not making the NCAA tournament. And so if you're Todd Golden, and thankfully I just saw the news today, Stanford gave an extension to their head coach, which is a little bit baffling, but also great news for the WCC potentially, because I thought that's where Todd Golden was going to be coaching next year. USC extended Andy Enfield, so he's not bouncing to Maryland. That's good news because I was worried about that as well. We'll see what happens at Cal and some of the other places around here. But like Kyle Smith coached at San Francisco, now the head coach at Washington State, Washington State, a program that faltered down the stretch, but was looking like a potential tournament team throughout most of the year. So I don't know how the WCC can retain these coaches just because of financial disadvantages and Gonzaga takes a lion's share of the money from that is made from when these teams make the NCAA tournament. Um, but I think to me, that just seems like such a critical part of this. Scheduling is always going to be a challenge, but if these teams can maintain good coaches and can just do their best to keep their players, to work hard on the transfer portal, I think a lot of people view the transfer portal as a positive thing for the WCC. And in a lot of ways it has been, but what if Jalen Williams goes to the PAC 12, you know, like that makes a lot of sense for him to potentially do that. And those are the kind of moves that I'm worried about because these mid-major conferences already struggle to retain talent. And if these guys don't have to sit out a year, they're a lot more likely to leave. I'm curious kind of what you think about that and how, how that might impact some of these mid-major programs. Yeah, I, I think you, you sort of have to embrace being a stepping stone for just the players and the coaches, yeah. because you yeah. look at, you look at a guy like Shantae Leggins, you know, he mm -hmm. was really good at Eastern Washington, but mm -hmm. Portland is considered a better job than that. Yeah. And you can't be afraid of him possibly being too good to go there because yeah. what you also don't want to do is be a place for retreads. You know, yeah. you look at Lorenzo Romar at, mm -hmm. at Pepperdine Mm -hmm. You know, he, he had a solid year with, with, with Colby Ross and Kessler Edwards, but mm -hmm. overall it's been disappointing. Do you, do you necessarily want to be a place where coaches know they can come and have security, but not necessarily be under any pressure to improve? Right. So having the young, so having, you know, the, the young up and coming guys that view it as, as a challenge, mm -hmm. and, you know, Todd Bolton does view it. I don't think he believes that he can't beat Gonzaga. He, no, he, he knows happens. that he can. Mm -hmm. So, Having that mentality is going to be the reason why he's going to be a candidate for the Pac-12. And look, there are better jobs, bigger, you know, better, mm -hmm. bigger races, bigger yeah. opportunities. It, mm -hmm. it is what it is for the WCC, but you can still be successful mm -hmm. as a program and you can still build off of it. I think a, a perfect example would be VCU. You know, after mm -hmm. losing Shaka Smart, you know, yeah. they could have, you know, folded. But when you look at Mike Rhodes now, he's just as good as Shaka in terms of have mm -hmm. keeping them successful in the A-10, and you can still have a program regardless of the coach, regardless of the players, whether they stick around for four years or two or whatever, right. still be successful. You know, it doesn't mm -hmm. all have to be Randy Bennett, who's there for 30-plus years. That's right. 
that's becoming more and more rare that you can't rely on that. But you can have a program that that is consistently successful that recruits and transfers know of. That mm-hmm. way, if guys don't want to, you know, settle for 10 minutes a game in the Pac-12 level, they can go be a star at the WCC and still mm-hmm. get, you know, national attention, television games, and potentially a spot to beat Gonzaga and, and really create history like Tommy yeah. Cousy has. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a, a really good point, too, on the, the coaching thing. Like, with Kyle Smith leaves at San Francisco and everybody's worried, like, is this program going to fall apart? They get Todd Golden, which is obviously phenomenal for them that he was there and, and – you know, is such a great basketball mind. But if he leaves, like San Francisco is a good enough spot where they're, they don't necessarily have to hire a retread. They don't necessarily have to hire a, a completely inexperienced coach. Like they can get somebody pretty good to start leading that program because they can say, look, two of our, our most, two most recent coaches are coaching high level programs. We made the tournament last year. You know, like we've de- developed really crucial talent in guys like Bouye. We've brought in high level transfers like Masalski. Like they can make, some of those arguments. And if you get two more teams in the program, in, in the conference, if Santa Clara can start, you know, pushing up enough to make those arguments for themselves. If, you know, if another program turns around and starts, you know, if Portland continues to build the way they've built, like you, you could be in a spot where I, I think you're right. You could really start to, you may not have coaches coaching there for 30 years, like Mark Few and Randy Bennett, but that's pretty darn rare. <laughs> it's not something that happens. All the fact that there's two of them in this conference is pretty rare as it is. And so I think that's a really good point. San Diego's going to be looking for a new coach them, them, themselves after they fired Sam Scholl. Hopefully they can find a coach that uh, that's willing to help grow that program as well and really get this conference up uh, up in a spot where they can you know be successful and have four or five teams that are really at least in that conversation throughout most of the season. Tristan. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, man. I really appreciate it. This was an awesome conversation. I look forward to many more conversations with you down the line uh, as the season continues uh, here in March. Uh, Do you want to let the people know where they can find your work, find you on Twitter for anybody who is interested? Yes. uh, You can find me on Twitter at HoopsNut351. I pretty much talk about not only Gonzaga, but college basketball in general. Mm -hmm. Uh, I write write for Bustin Brackets, so college basketball blog, part fan side. We cover all 32 conferences, all the teams, coaches, and players, including Gonzaga and WCC. So Mm -hmm. make sure you check there as often as possible because we try to write every day there. Mm -hmm. And I just appreciate you having me on, Andy. I would love to come back as much as you want, especially during the offseason where the transfer portal and the NBA talk is going to be crazy. A lot of interesting decisions are going to be made regarding Gonzaga because technically everybody could come back. Mm -hmm. (laughs) This is It's definitely going to be very interesting to to follow what Gonzaga does, not only in March, but in April and May, too. Absolutely. Tristan, thank you again. I'm excited to to see what's going to happen with the Zags. Let's see what's going to happen this offseason. But obviously, uh, very happy that we have, hopefully, as many as five or six more uh, Gonzaga basketball games before we get there. Uh, Have a good weekend, everybody. We'll be back next Monday. The next time that we have a show, we will have a bracket as well. Very, very excited to get a chance to talk about that. Uh, Thank you again to those of you who have made Locked On Zags your first listen of the day. Now's a great time to make your second listen, the Locked On NFL Draft podcast. Ryan Tracy and former NFL cornerback Eric Crocker bring the NFL Draft to life every day with insight and analysis on college football prospects and NFL front offices. It's free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you all for listening and go Zags.